again, everybody. Welcome back to Quantitative Reasoning. Today we are in section 11.6, and we're going to be going further into probability, talking today about events involving not and or. So we only have two objectives in this section, and they are to find the probability that an event will not occur, and also to find the probability of one event or a second event occurring. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Let's start by talking about the probability of an event not occurring. So if we know P of E, that is, if we know the probability of an event E, then we can determine the probability that the event will not occur, which is written P of not E. The event not E is the complement of E. You remember how we talked about complements way back in Chapter 2. So the event not E is the complement of E, because it is the set of all outcomes from the sample space S that are not outcomes in the event E. So for example, imagine we have a spinner where all seven colors from the rainbow are on this spinner and each one takes up an equal amount of space. So if we say that event E is spinning either red, orange, or green, then event not E would be spinning any of the other colors. So that would be spinning yellow, blue, indigo, or violet. Now there are seven colors in our sample space and each one takes up an equal amount of space on the spinner. So if there are three colors in event E, then the probability of spinning one of the colors in set E would be three out of seven. And the probability of spinning one of the colors in not E would be 4 out of 7. So notice that 3 sevenths plus 4 sevenths would be 7 sevenths, which is 1. And that's the way it works when we're talking about an event and the complement of the event, because between the two of them, they will cover all of the outcomes in the sample space. So whatever outcomes are in E, all the rest of the outcomes are in not E. So in any experiment, either an event must occur or its complement must occur. Because remember, between the two of them, they cover all of the outcomes in the sample space. So either one of them happens or the other one happens. And so, just like we saw on the last slide, the sum of the probability that an event will occur plus the probability that it will not occur is 1. So we can write it like this. The probability of E plus the probability of not E is 1. Now we can rearrange this equation to isolate the probability of not E. So if we were to subtract P of E from both sides, then we would end up with P of not E equals 1 minus P of E. So the probability of event not E is equal to 1 minus the probability of E. And we could also say that the probability of E is equal to 1 minus the probability of not E. It works both ways. Okay, so what we need right now is an example. So let's look at example one together. Part A says, if you are dealt one card from a standard 52 card deck, find the probability that you are not dealt a queen. Okay, so every card in this deck is either a queen or not a queen. And that means that the event of being dealt a queen and the event of being dealt a card that is not a queen, those two are complementary events. Okay, so that means that we can write the following equation. The probability of being dealt a queen plus the probability of being dealt a card that is not a queen equals 1. And now, just like we saw on the last slide, we can rearrange this so that the probability of being dealt a card that is not a queen is isolated. We just need to subtract P of Q from both sides. So now we will have an equation that says the probability that a card is not a queen is equal to 1 minus the probability that the card is a queen. So we just need to plug in the probability that the card is a queen and then we'll be able to calculate the probability that the card is not a queen. So that's going to be 1 minus P of Q 
Now there are four queens in the deck, and we know that the deck is made up of 52 cards. So the probability that our card is a queen is 4 divided by 52. Now we are not going to mess around with the fractions here. You've got a calculator handy, so you may as well use the fraction function on your calculator. So you'll say 1 minus 4 fraction 52 equals, and you'll get 12 thirteenths as the simplified fraction. Now you may be saying, do I need to simplify 4 over 52 because that can be simplified? But the answer is no, let the calculator handle it. If the calculator is going to do the subtraction for us, let it do the simplifying for us as well. So 1 minus 4 fraction 52 equals, and you'll get this simplified fraction as the result. Now let's make sure that this makes sense. Most of the cards in the deck are not queens, and this fraction 12 thirteenths is very close to 1. So it's almost certain that we'll be dealt a card that's not a queen, and that makes sense because most of the cards in the deck are not queens. So you always want to compare what you know about the situation to the number that you got and make sure that it makes sense. And in this case, it does make sense. So now let's look at part B. If you were dealt one card from a standard 52 card deck, find the probability that you were not dealt a diamond. So you can probably tell that just like we saw in part A, every card in the deck can either be classified as a diamond or not a diamond. And so the event of getting dealt a diamond and the event of getting dealt a card that's not a diamond are complementary events. One or the other is bound to happen because every card in the sample space is either a diamond or not a diamond. Okay, so that means we can go ahead and say that the probability that a card is not a diamond is equal to 1 minus the probability that the card is a diamond. We can write this equation because we've already established that every card in the deck is either a diamond or not a diamond, so these two probabilities are complementary. So the probability that we're dealt a card that is not a diamond is equal to 1 minus the probability that the card is a diamond. Now here are the diamonds in the sample space. You can see there are 13 diamonds in the deck. And so the probability that the card is a diamond is 13 divided by 52. Now using the fraction function on your calculator, 1 minus 13 fraction 52 equals 3 fourths. And again, we just want to verify that this number makes sense. This number corresponds to a 75% chance. We know that 3 fourths in decimal form is 0.75. So there's a 75% probability that we would be dealt a card that is not a diamond. Well, that makes sense because most of the cards in the deck are not diamonds. Only 25% of the cards in the deck are diamonds, so the other three-fourths are not diamonds. Now let's look at example two together. So this says the circle graph shows the time breakdown in minutes for various aspects of an average 190-minute NFL TV broadcast. What is the probability that a minute of the broadcast is not devoted to game action or actual football? Express the probability as a simplified fraction. Okay, so let's look at this circle graph together. The 11 minutes that are actually football being played on screen are right here. You can see that that's a fairly small piece of the total. So all of the rest of the minutes are either replays, commercials, just all these other things that happen during the game that we're used to seeing on TV. But according to this circle graph, only this very small part is actual game action. Now, could we add up all of these other minutes and find the probability that way? Yes, but I want you to get in the habit of using complements whenever you can. So since every minute of the game is either game action or not game action, we can say that the probability of choosing a minute that is game action and the probability of choosing a minute that is not game action are going to be complementary probabilities because every minute of the broadcast is either one or the other. It's either game action or it's not. So we can right away say that the probability that we choose a minute that is not game action 
is equal to one minus the probability that it is game action. Okay, so this probability will be easier to calculate than this one because we can read this one off of the graph. So the probability that we choose a minute that is not game action is equal to one minus the probability that it is game action. So there are only 11 minutes that are game action. So this probability that the minute is game action is going to be 11 divided by the total 190 minutes from the broadcast and 1 minus 11 divided by 190 is going to give us 179 over 190. And that fraction cannot be simplified, and so this is our final answer. Now, again, just looking back to make sure that our answer makes sense, we know that the probability we calculated is very close to 1, and that would mean that this event is an almost certain event. Now, when you look back at the circle graph, you can see that almost all of the minutes in the broadcast were something other than game action. So it would make sense that if we randomly select one of these minutes, chances are pretty good that it's not one of the game action minutes. And so the probability of choosing one of these other minutes should be very high, and that's what we found, so that makes sense. Now let's look at example three together. It says the table shows the distribution by age of a random sample of 3,000 American moviegoers ages 12 through 74. If one moviegoer is randomly selected from this population, find the probability that, and then there's a different group that we're finding the probability for in each part. Part A says find the probability that the moviegoer is not in the 25 to 44 age range. So let's look at our table just for a second. We can see that the moviegoers are divided into four groups, and we have this age group 25 to 44 right here. Now we're supposed to be finding the probability that a randomly selected moviegoer is not in this group. But everyone who was part of the sample was either in this age group or they were not. So if they were not in the 25 to 44 age group, they would either be in the 12 to 24 age group or one of these other two groups. Now, since everybody in the sample is either in this group or they're not, that means those are complementary events. So we can write the equation that the probability that a random moviegoer is not in the 25 to 44 age group is equal to 1 minus the probability that they are in that age group. Now the probability that they are in that age group is going to be very easy to calculate because there were 1,080 people in that age group and there are 3,000 in the total, so 3,000 in the sample space. So 1 minus the probability that they are in that age group is going to be 1 minus 1,080 divided by 3,000. And when you do this on your calculator, make sure to use fraction form. So 1 minus 1,080 fraction bar 3,000 equals 16 25ths. Now, does our answer make sense? Well, if there are 3,000 people in the whole group and just over 1,000 of them are in the 25 to 44 age group, there's about a one-third probability that they are in that group, and therefore there's about a two-thirds probability that they're not in that group. So this does not simplify to exactly two-thirds, but it's pretty close. If it were 16 over 24, it would simplify to two-thirds. So this is a reasonable fraction to expect given these numbers. Now let's look at part B. Find the probability that a randomly selected moviegoer is at least 25 years old. Okay, at least 25 means they're either 25, 26, 27, right? They're older than 25. So where on the table are we going to find the people that are 25 or more? Well, all of those people would either be in this second group or the third or the fourth group. The only group that contains people that are not at least 25 would be this first group. So we can say that the probability that they are at least 25 is equal to 1 minus the probability that they're not at least 25. See, everybody is either at least 25 or they're not. 
So if they're not in the group that is at least 25, they must be in the group that's not at least 25. And it's very easy to calculate the probability that they are in this group. So we'll say the probability that they are at least 25 is equal to 1 minus the probability that they are not at least 25, and that's going to be 900 divided by 3,000. Okay, now on your calculator, using the fraction button, 1 minus 900 fraction 3,000 simplifies to 7 tenths. And then for part C, find the probability that a randomly selected moviegoer is at most 64 years old. Okay, at most 64 means that they are 64 or less, right? So 64, 63, 62, anybody 64 or younger. Well, where are those people? Those people are in one of these first three groups. The only people that are not at most 64 are the people in this last group. Okay, so the two are complementary. They're either at most 64 or they're not at most 64. They're more than 64. So we can say that the probability that a moviegoer is at most 64 is 1 minus the probability that they're not at most 64. And the probability that they're not at most 64 is going to be 180 divided by 3,000. So the probability that they are at most 64 is 1 minus 180 divided by 3,000. And using the fraction function on your calculator, you'll get a simplified fraction of 47 fiftieths. Now, does this make sense? This fraction is very close to 1 because most of the people in the table are in this at most 64 group. They're in the group that's not yet 64. So, yes, it makes sense that the probability of selecting someone who's at most 64 is very large. Now let's change gears a little bit and talk about or probabilities with mutually exclusive events. So if it is impossible for two events, A and B, to occur simultaneously, we say that these events are mutually exclusive, meaning if one happens, the other cannot happen at the same time. And if two events A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A or B is equal to just the probability of A plus the probability of B. So we can calculate the two probabilities separately and just add them together. We saw this same kind of idea back in Chapter 2 when we were working with sets. We saw that if two sets were completely disjoint, that is, if they did not overlap at all, then the number of things in the union was equal to the number of things in A plus the number of things in B. And it works the same way here with probabilities. So let's look at example four together. In part A, it says if one card is randomly selected from a deck of cards, what is the probability of selecting a king or a queen? Now, a card can either be a king or it can be a queen. Remember, here are the kings right here, and here are the queens. There's no way for a card to be both a king and a queen at the same time. So we can say that the event of selecting a king and the event of selecting a queen are mutually exclusive events, and that means we can find the probability of selecting one or the other by calculating the two probabilities separately. So now we can say that the probability of selecting either a king or a queen is equal to the probability of selecting a king plus the probability of selecting a queen. Now the probability of selecting a king is the number of kings divided by the number of cards in the sample space, which is the whole deck. So the number of cards that are kings is four, right? One, two, three, four kings right here. So the probability of selecting a king is four divided by 52, and then we want to add the probability of selecting a queen. So we look at the number of queens, one, two, three, four queens. So the probability of selecting a queen would also be four divided by 52. Now four over 52 plus four over 52 
would be 8 over 52. Of course, your calculator will do this for you, so you may never see this fraction. But if you were doing it without a calculator, you would say 4 over 52 plus 4 over 52 is 8 over 52. And then this fraction reduces to 2 thirteenths. Now, this is the fraction that you'll see on your calculator if you just enter 4 fraction 52 plus 4 fraction 52. Now, does this probability make sense? I think so, because out of all the cards in the deck, only 8 of them fit the description of either being a king or a queen. And so 8 cards among 52 is not a very large probability. And here we can see that 2 thirteenths is a pretty small fraction as well. And here is part B of example 4, and we're switching from cards to dice now. So it says, if you roll a single six-sided die, what is the probability of getting either a 4 or a 5? Okay, so you can roll a 4 or a 5, but you can't roll both at the same time, right? And that means that these two events are mutually exclusive. So we can say that the probability of rolling a 4 or a 5 is equal to the probability of rolling a 4 plus the probability of rolling a 5. Because they are mutually exclusive, we can separate them like this and just add the probabilities of each individual event. Now, out of the six sides on a die, only one of them will be a 4. So the probability of rolling a 4 is 1 sixth. And also out of the six sides on the die, only one of them will be a 5. So the probability of rolling a 5 is also 1 sixth. And now 1 sixth plus 1 sixth adds up to 2 sixths, and that simplifies to 1 third. And again, if you're adding without a calculator, you'll see this fraction. If you're adding with the calculator, you'll just see the 1 third at the end. And part C. If you roll two dice, what is the probability of their sum being either a 2 or 12? Okay, first let's think about whether these two events are mutually exclusive or not. If you roll two dice and you add together what's on the face of the dice, then the sum might be a 2 or it might be a 12 or it might be something else, but I think you'll agree with me that it can't be both a 2 and a 12 at the same time, right? And that means that these two events are mutually exclusive. And so that means that we can say the probability of getting a sum equal to 2 or a sum equal to 12 is equal to the probability of getting a sum of 2 plus the probability of getting a sum of 12. See, because they're mutually exclusive, we can just add the two individual probabilities together. Now, what is the probability of getting a sum equal to 2? Well, if we go look at our sample space, there's only one pair of dice that are going to sum to 2, and that would be the event of rolling a 1 and a 1. And so there are 36 outcomes in the sample space, but only one of them will give us a sum of 2. So the probability of rolling two dice and getting a sum of 2 is 1 over 36. And then we need to calculate the probability of getting a sum of 12. And again, there's only one pair of dice that will give us a sum of 12, and that's the event of rolling two sixes. And so there's one outcome there, and the probability of getting a sum of 12 would also be 1 over 36. Now, 1 36th plus 1 36th would be 2 36th, and that's going to simplify to 1 18th. So the probability of getting two dice that sum to either 2 or 12 would be 1 18th. And that's a pretty small fraction, but you can see that out of all 36 possibilities, only two of them do what's required by the description here, so it is a pretty low probability. And here we have Part D. A political discussion group consists of 30 Republicans, 25 Democrats, 8 Independents, and 4 members of the Green Party. If one person is randomly selected from the group, find the probability of choosing an Independent or a Green. Okay, so the first thing we want to think about is, are these mutually exclusive events? And they are, because each person that they mentioned here is a member of only one party. 
There are 30 who are Republicans, 25 who are Democrats, and so on. So there's no one who is in both the Independent Party and the Green Party at the same time. That means that we can find the probability of choosing an Independent or a Green by adding together the two probabilities of the two separate events. But now in order to calculate those two probabilities, we're going to need to know how many people are in the sample space. So let's go ahead and add up all of the people here. So the number of elements or the number of people in the sample space is going to be 30 plus 25 plus 8 plus 4, and that adds up to 67 people in our sample space. So now we can say the probability of choosing either an independent or a green is equal to the probability of choosing an independent plus the probability of choosing a green, and there were eight people who were members of the independent party, so the probability of choosing an independent would be 8 divided by 67. And then there were four members of the Green Party, so the probability of choosing a member of the Green Party is 4 divided by 67. Now 8 67ths plus 4 67ths is 12 67ths, and that fraction cannot be simplified, so this is the total that your calculator would give you. And so the probability of choosing someone who is an independent or a green would be 12 67ths. Now let's talk a little bit about probabilities for events that are not mutually exclusive. So we've seen this kind of thing before, way back in Chapter 2, when we were working with Venn diagrams. So events that are not mutually exclusive can occur simultaneously. For example, a card can be both a diamond and a picture card. And you can see that here in the overlapping part of this Venn diagram. The diamonds include the ace of diamonds, two of diamonds, and so on, all the way up to the jack, queen, and king of diamonds. But the face cards, or the picture cards, include all of the jacks, queens, and kings from the whole deck. So the jack of diamonds, the queen of diamonds, and the king of diamonds belong to both groups. They are both picture cards and they are diamonds. So now, based on a standard 52-card deck, let's calculate the probability of drawing a card that is a diamond. We know that there are 13 diamonds in the deck, so the probability of drawing a diamond would be 13 divided by 52, and we know that can reduce, but let's just leave it like this for right now. And let's also calculate the probability of drawing a picture card. Now, I know you can't see your deck of cards right now, but you can look at this Venn diagram and they have all of the picture cards listed for us. So there are four different suits and each one contains a jack, a queen, and a king. So there are 12 cards in the whole deck that can be classified as picture cards. So the probability of randomly drawing a picture card from the deck would be 12 out of 52. And then finally, let's look at the probability of drawing a diamond or a picture card. Okay. Before, when we had mutually exclusive events, we were able to just add 13 plus 12, and we could have said 13 plus 12 is 25, so the answer would be 25 over 52. The problem here is that we have three cards that are both, and those three cards are counted in this 13 here, but they are also counted in this 12 here. So if we just add together the 13 and the 12, we will be counting the jack queen, and king twice, and we can't do that. We shouldn't do that. So when we calculate the probability of drawing a card that's either a diamond or a picture card, let's count here. There would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 cards that are either a diamond or a picture card. So the probability of drawing a diamond or a picture card is 22 divided by 52. So again, notice that that is not equal to the sum of these two. 12 plus 13 would be 25, and we didn't get 25 over 52, we got 22 over 52. So we have to adjust our formula a little bit when we're talking about events that are not mutually exclusive. So here is the new formula. When two events are known to be not mutually exclusive, 
then the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Okay, do you remember from when we talked about Venn diagrams, the A and B would be the part that's in the overlap right here. And again, the reason why we have to subtract this is because these cards that fit both qualifications have been counted twice. They are counted in the probability of A, and they're also counted in the probability of B. So we need to subtract them once because we do want them counted, but we don't want them counted twice. In set notation, it would have looked like this. The probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B. Remember that from chapter 2? Okay, now in example 5, we're going to get to practice with our formula for non-mutually exclusive events. So part A says, in a group of 25 baboons, 18 enjoy grooming their neighbors, 16 enjoy screeching wildly, and 10 enjoy doing both. If one baboon is selected at random, find the probability that it enjoys grooming its neighbor or screeching wildly. Okay, so let's go ahead and write down what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the probability that they enjoy grooming their neighbor or screeching wildly, and we'll just abbreviate here. So probability that they enjoy grooming their neighbor or screeching wildly. And there are some baboons who enjoy doing both. So we have to use the formula for non-mutually exclusive events. So it's going to be the probability that they enjoy grooming their neighbor plus the probability that they enjoy screeching wildly minus the probability that they enjoy doing both. Now they told us in the problem that there are 18 baboons who enjoy grooming their neighbors and there are 25 total. So the probability that a randomly selected baboon enjoys grooming its neighbor is 18 divided by 25. And there are 16 who enjoy screeching wildly, so the probability that you randomly select one that enjoys screeching wildly is going to be 16 out of 25. And then the ones that enjoy doing both have been counted in both sets here. So we need to subtract the overlap. So we need to subtract the probability that they enjoy doing both. So that would be minus 10 divided by 25. So now 18 plus 16 is 34 and 34 minus 10 is 24. So we're going to come out with a probability here of 24 25ths. So you see how that works and you can probably see that if we forgot to subtract the 10 out of 25 here, 18 plus 16 would have given us a number bigger than 25 and we would have gotten a probability here that was greater than 1, and we know that can never happen. We know probability has to be either equal to 0 or 1 or somewhere in between. It can't be more than 1. And here's part B. In a group of 50 students, 23 take math, 11 take psychology, and 7 take both math and psychology. If one student is selected at random, find the probability that the student takes math or psychology. Okay, so there are some students who take both, so these two events are not mutually exclusive and we'll have to subtract the ones that take both math and psychology. So let's write down the probability that they take math or psychology is equal to the probability that they take math plus the probability that they take psychology minus the probability that they take both. Okay, there are 23 out of the 50 who take math. So the probability that they take math is 23 fiftieths. There are 11 who take psychology, so the probability that they take psychology is 11 fiftieths. And then there are 7 who take both, so the probability that they're taking both math and psychology is 7 fiftieths. And now 23 plus 11 is 34, and 34 minus 7 is 27. So we will end up with a probability of 27 fiftieths. And then let's look at part C. A single die is rolled. Find the probability of rolling an even number or a number less than five. Okay, so first we want to decide if these two events are mutually exclusive. 
is it possible for a number to be both even and also at the same time less than 5? Well, of course it is. There are numbers that are even that are less than 5. So we're going to need to subtract the probability of rolling a number that does both of those things. So let's go ahead and write down our sample space so we can see what we're trying to think about. On a regular six-sided die, we would have faces labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Okay, so the probability of rolling an even number or a number less than 5 would be the probability of rolling an even number plus the probability of rolling a number less than 5 minus the probability of getting a number that is both even and less than 5. Okay, so first for the probability of rolling an even number. When we look at our sample space, there are 1, 2, 3 even numbers. So the probability of rolling an even number would be 3 sixths. And then for the probability of rolling a number less than 5, there are four outcomes that are less than five. The one, two, three, or four would be less than five. And so the probability of rolling a number less than five would be four sixths. And then what are the numbers that are both even and less than five? That would be the two and the four, right? So the probability of rolling a number that is both even and less than five would be two out of six. And now, adding all of this up, 3 sixths plus 4 sixths would be 7 sixths, and 7 sixths minus 2 sixths would be 5 sixths. So the probability of rolling a number that is either even or less than 5 would be 5 sixths. And here's part D. You are dealt one card from a 52 card deck. Find the probability that you are dealt a heart or a face card. So, of course, the event of a card being a heart and the event of a card being a face card, these are not mutually exclusive events because it is possible for a card to be both a heart and a face card at the same time. Let's look at our deck of cards here. So, this second row contains all of the cards that are hearts. And then these last three columns are all of the face cards. You can see that we have three cards that are both a heart and a face card. So when we calculate the probability that a card is either a heart or a face card, we will need to add the probability that the card is a heart plus the probability that it's a face card and then subtract the probability that it is both a heart and a face card. Okay, so for the probability that a card is a heart, we would look at these 13 cards here. These are all of the hearts, and there are 13 of them. So the probability that a card is a heart would be 13 divided by 52. And then for the probability that a card is a face card, we would look at these 12 cards here. There are 12 face cards in the deck. So the probability that a card is a face card is 12 divided by 52. And then we need to subtract the probability that a card is both a heart and a face card. So that would be the probability that we get one of these three cards here. So that probability is 3 divided by 52. Okay, so now 13 over 52 plus 12 over 52 minus 3 over 52 all adds up to 22 over 52. And of course, 22 over 52 can be simplified because both of these numbers can be divided by 2. So that would give us 11 over 26. And if you just add these fractions on your calculator, you won't even see the 22 over 52. You'll just go directly to 11 over 26. And now we're going to look at part E together. So if you would like to pause the video and try this one on your own, I think that's a great idea. Okay, and now I'm going to go through it with you. So it says you are dealt one card from a 52 card deck. Find the probability that you are dealt a six or a black card. Now, of course, here are the sixes right here, and you can see that two of them are black. And so it is possible for a card to be both a six and a black card at the same time. So we can see that the event of a card being a six and the event of a card being black are not mutually exclusive events. So when we calculate the probability that a card is either a 6 or a black card, we'll need to calculate the probability that the card is a 6 plus the probability that the card is black minus the probability that the card is both a 6 and black. 
Now there are four sixes in a deck of cards, so the probability that the card is a six would be four divided by 52. And for the black cards, we can see that the 13 clubs are black and the 13 spades are also black. So 13 plus 13 is 26. So the probability that the card is a black card would be 26 divided by 52. And then we need to subtract the probability that the card is both a six and black. Now there are two cards, like we said, that are both the six of spades and the six of clubs. So the probability that the card is both a six and black would be two divided by 52. And now four plus 26 is 30 and 30 minus two is 28. So these three fractions add up to 28 over 52 and both of these numbers can be divided by four. So that would leave us with a simplified fraction of seven thirteenths. Now again, if you're doing this on your calculator, you'll just enter the three fractions here and when you press equal, it will give you the simplified answer. Now let's look at example six. So it says the table shows the marital status of the U.S. population in 2020. Numbers in the table are expressed in millions. If one person is randomly selected from the population represented in the table, find the probability that A, the person is divorced or male. Okay, so this is the same type of table that we saw when we looked at empirical probability in the last section. And we remember that on these tables, a lot of times the last column and the bottom row will be the totals of the numbers that are in the actual table. Now, when we think about calculating the probability that a randomly selected person is either divorced or male, we need to ask ourselves, is it possible for somebody to be both divorced and male at the same time? And you can tell from the table that it is possible because there are some people that are in both categories. And so these two events are not mutually exclusive. So we'll need to use our formula for the probability of non-mutually exclusive events. Okay, so we can write the probability of a randomly selected person being either divorced or male is equal to the probability that the person is divorced plus the probability that the person is male minus the probability that the person is both. And now remember that even though the data in the table is given in millions, we don't have to write the millions down. We can just use the numbers as they appear in the table because millions in the top divided by millions in the bottom would cancel out anyway. So the probability that a randomly selected person is divorced would be the total number of divorced people, which is 26 million, divided by the total number of people in the table, which is 264 million. And then we're going to add to that the probability that the person is male. So the number of males in the table is 128 million, and we divide that by 264 million. And then we need to subtract the probability that a person is both divorced and male. Well, that would be this number of people right here. And so we would subtract 11 over 264. Now, of course, we're about to reach for the calculator, but the way we enter these numbers into the calculator depends on whether we want the answer to come out in fraction form or decimal form. So let's take a look at the calculator. Now, to get the answer in fraction form, of course, we would want to use our fraction button here. So we would enter each of our fractions, like 26 fraction 264 plus, and then do the next one, and then minus 11 fraction 264. And when we hit equal, of course, we get our answer in fraction form. That's the simplified fraction. Now, if you get a fraction and then afterward you realize that you need a decimal, you can just use this fraction to decimal function right here. You see where it says F to D. So that's the second function of this button. So if we want to convert to decimal form, we'll hit second F to D and then equals, and there is our decimal. But if you know from the beginning that you're going to want your answer in decimal form, then just avoid the fraction button altogether and just use the regular divide key. So we would just enter 26 divided by 264 plus 128 divided by 264 minus 11 divided by 264. And there is our same decimal approximation. Now let me show you something even better. Since all three of these fractions have the same denominator, Here's something else you can do. 
you could just add the tops together. So I could say 26 plus 128 minus 11, get an answer for that, and then divide by 264 once at the end. See, there's that same decimal approximation. And also remember, when we have a decimal approximation, if we want to go back to fraction form, we can use that same fraction to decimal function to change back into fraction form, and there's the fraction representation. And in this particular problem, we want the answer in decimal form, so here is our rounded answer from the calculator. Okay, now in part B, they're asking for the probability that the person is married or divorced. And remember that this table is just representing what was the current status of these people at the time that they answered the question. And that means that these two events are mutually exclusive and there won't be anything to subtract because there's no overlap between the two events. So the probability that a randomly selected person from this table is married or divorced is going to be equal to the probability that the person is married plus the probability that they are divorced. Now when we go to the table, the total number of married people was 137 million. So the probability that a randomly selected person is married is going to be 137 over 264. And then we add the probability that the person is divorced, and the total number of divorced people from the table was 26 million. So we add 26 over 264. And since we want this answer to come out in decimal form, we will enter this into our calculator with the division key. So you'll say 137 divided by 264 plus 26 divided by 264 equals, and when you get your decimal and round it to two places, it should be approximately 0.62. Now let's look at part C. So now we want to find the probability that a randomly selected person is married or female. Okay, so these two events are not mutually exclusive. It's possible for somebody in this table to be both married and female. And so when we calculate the probability that a randomly selected person is either married or female, we will need to add the probability that the person is married plus the probability that they are female and then subtract the probability that they are both married and female. So let's go to the table. So the probability that a randomly selected person is married is going to be 137 over 264. The probability that a randomly selected person is female is going to be 136 over 264. And then for the probability that they are both, we can see on the table that 69 million people are both married and female. So then we would subtract 69 over 264. And if we enter this on the calculator using the division key, we'll come out in decimal form and we'll round to two decimal places for an answer of approximately 0.77. Okay, everybody, that is it for section 11.6. And so I will see you in the next video for section 11.7 when we will finish up chapter 11 on probability. See you next time. Bye-bye.